Hey, chicken sauce, Michelle here. Is rosemary oil a natural science-backed treatment for hair growth? According to a lot of doctors and scientists and trichologists across the internet, yes, there is scientific proof rosemary oil works as well as minoxidil. Here's the science behind why rosemary oil and rosemary water work to grow your hair. 2015 studies showed rosemary oil to be just as effective as, as minoxidil. Best and worst hair loss treatments according to dermatologists. My takeaway from this is that rosemary oil can be beneficial for patients suffering from androgenetic alopecia. Use topical rosemary oil diluted onto your scalp. Studies show it's as effective as minoxidil. There are three derma-proof hacks for using rosemary oil to help regrow your hair. Yes, it can help, but you have to be consistent with use for at least six months to determine whether it works for you or not. And it all seems to come down to this one study. For a long time, I didn't look into it. I just kind of assumed it was legit because everyone cited it. Anyway, it turns out I shouldn't have assumed that because when I finally looked at the study, I really wasn't prepared for how bad the study was. So today I'm going to explain why I'm going to talk about what the science actually tells us about rosemary oil and hair loss, whether it's safe to try, and give you some tips for critically assessing studies so you don't fall for bad science. And as a bonus, you'll also understand how a peer-reviewed journal published this AI-generated rat thing. So this is a study that everyone is citing, rosemary oil versus minoxidil 2% for the treatment of androgenetic alopecia, a randomized comparative trial. It was published in SkinMed, which is a peer-reviewed journal, and peer-reviewed is generally considered higher quality when it comes to scientific sources. And it kind of is, but it also really isn't. To understand peer review, we need to talk about how science works. Back in the day when scientists looked like this, to do science you would just poke around some random stuff, find something interesting. Science was pretty new back then so everyone was just discovering stuff everywhere. You would go tell your scientist pals about it at your science club meetings. They'd clap or argue with you. Some of them would build on your discoveries in their research. You might write a book about it or get an article published in a magazine, which in science is called a journal. Scientists would clap or argue with you. If they really didn't like it, they might burn down your house. What are you doing? Why is the door locked? But after a few hundred years, people had discovered a lot of stuff. So science had gotten a lot more complex. A single journal editor didn't know everything about the subject anymore. So to work out which articles were good enough to publish, they would ask other scientists who knew more about that topic to weigh in. By the 1960s, with super advanced things like photocopiers, this process of peer review, which is just getting other scientists to decide if your articles were good or not, this became way more structured. These days, the general process is you do some research, you write an article, and you send it to a journal. The editor checks that it mostly looks okay. If the research is important enough, that is going to come up again later, and if it matches the journal topic. If yes, they send it to usually two or three scientists who specialize in your area. These reviewers will check things like whether the equipment you're using will actually work for what you're doing, whether your conclusions make scientific sense with what we already know from all of the other studies out there. The reviewers send feedback to the editor and your article will be accepted or rejected. Usually, if it's accepted, you'll still have to make a few changes. Then your paper gets published. Yay! After the paper gets published, then there's post-publication review, which is where other scientists will comment on your work or try to repeat your experiments. Papers might end up corrected or retracted, it might end up compared to other studies and reviews and textbooks and add to our general body of scientific evidence. That is the less complicated established science that you might get taught at school and university. Now, this system is generally pretty good, or at least it's probably one of the better systems for building scientific knowledge, what we know about how the world works, but it is really far from perfect. Here are some of the big issues with peer review, and this is a very incomplete list. Less popular topics aren't scrutinized as much. Plenty of dodgy papers get through, and it is especially the case with an area like beauty, where a lot of the most rigorous research never gets published. I talked about this on my video on whether rationale is a scam, so there is not a lot of replication, and not a lot of scientists are discussing and critiquing the studies that do come out. Plus, peer review isn't really rewarded much. Peer reviewers aren't paid or recognized when they do good peer review. Peer review is anonymous and voluntary, so the quality is pretty variable, and it tends to take a really long time. If a review is checking a paper that they know probably isn't going to have a lot of people reading it, they might not take it as seriously, maybe they won't read it super closely. Peer reviewers can also be biased. They might not read it as critically if one of the researchers is really well known in the field or if they come from a prestigious institution, just because you would expect them to do good research. It's actually a really well-known hack for getting papers published quickly with minimal revisions. You just stick a well-known author on there. 
It's one reason why there's so many examples of papers now from high-profile authors being retracted for blatant issues like bad Photoshop. There are also dodgy journals that might not actually do peer review. They just don't bother sending the papers out for peer review, they just put it through a process and tick it off. Now, a dodgy journal doesn't mean that the study is automatically bad, it just means that you don't know if it's actually been peer reviewed properly. At the same time, a good journal doesn't mean that the study is automatically reliable, it's just that hopefully the obviously dodgy stuff is more likely to have been weeded out. So all of this just means that you have to be really careful when you're looking at a scientific paper. You can't just take what it says at face value, you need to read the whole thing slowly and carefully to work out if you should actually trust what it says. And this brings us to the next problem with papers. A lot of the time, you might not actually be able to read the full thing. Lots of papers are behind paywalls, and it is a pretty crappy system because the journals don't pay for the research, it's taxpayers or industry. The peer reviewers review for free, and the authors usually have to pay for the journal to publish the paper. But then the journal or the publisher gets to charge people to read it, and no, the authors do not get royalties. There are regulations coming in to make government-funded research publicly available, but it is an ongoing process. But the part that is always free to read is this, which is called the abstract. It's meant to be a summary of the paper, and I think it's what a lot of people were basing their rosemary oil opinions on, without reading the full actual paper. But this is a trap. It is the most common trap with reading studies. You never trust the abstract. This article I co-wrote lists a whole bunch of traps, but this one is the biggest. You're really just meant to use the abstract to work out if you should read the rest of the paper, if it's relevant to what you're researching. The abstract is really short, they can't include a lot in there, and you won't be able to critically assess if what they're doing is actually making sense. It will be missing a lot of the limitations of the study, and the authors probably only included the results that they wanted to highlight. And abstracts are usually not an accurate summary. A lot of the time it's treated like it's advertising for the rest of the paper to make you want to read the full study. The abstract is the first thing that journal editors and reviewers will see, well, after the title and the authors. There are more papers being submitted than can actually be published, so research that comes across as more important is going to be more likely to be published. So if you read a lot of papers, you will notice this pattern, which is the abstracts usually hype up the paper a bit too much. So think of the abstract as like the two sentence synopsis of a movie. Like, this sounds quite promising. This sounds reasonably straightforward to understand. This doesn't sound like an incredible work of genius. And this paper's abstract actually sounds pretty good. There's a total of 100 people, which is a lot for a cosmetic study. More subjects means more repetitions, so the results are less likely to be a fluke. The treatments were used for six months, which seems like a reasonably long time. Rosemary oil also isn't being tested on its own, it's being compared with minoxidil, which is one of the most popular hair loss treatments. This isn't quite as good as comparing it against a placebo treatment which has no active ingredients, but a lot of cosmetic studies just use the treatment on its own, so again, this is a promising sign. Now the results part of the abstract also sound really impressive. Both groups experience a significant increase in hair count at the six month endpoint. No significant difference was found between the study groups regarding hair count either at month three or month six. A word of warning here in science, significant doesn't mean significant, like there was a lot more hair. It basically means that statistically the increase is pretty likely to be because of something actually happening here, rather than because of random variation. Significant doesn't tell you about the size of the increase, it could still be really small, like just one extra hair. Scientists sometimes use words a bit weirdly, it is another of the many traps that you can fall into when reading papers. So if this abstract was all that you read and you assumed that it was accurate, then rosemary oil does sound really promising. So let's ruin it all by reading the actual paper. Here are the standard parts of a scientific paper. The most important parts to read are the methods and the results because those tell you what the paper is actually about, what original research the authors did. It is the whole point of the paper. The problem is that these are usually the hardest parts of the paper to read and evaluate. They're more technical, it's where you get complicated words and numbers and symbols. And you do need to know a bit about the topic already to be able to assess these to any proper level. The abstract, introduction, discussion, and conclusion are much more friendlier to read, they mostly have normal words, and they tell a nicer story, but they are the author's interpretations of what they found. So those are going to be a bit more subjective and more liable to spin. And if the interpretation here is sus, that is a huge red flag, but before we can judge whether or not it is sus, we need to look at what it is we're interpreting. Now all of this sounds really intimidating, like you have to be an active researcher to spot bad science. 
but I don't think that's actually the case. One thing I've noticed in my 12 years of interpreting and talking about beauty science is that a paper that has really big problems with the methodology usually will mess up in other places too. So you don't really need to be that familiar with experimental methods to be able to flag a paper as sus as a paper that you probably don't want to take too seriously. And this paper is a really good example. What made me go and read this paper in more detail is coming across a reel on Instagram from Dr. Leona Yip, who is an Australian dermatologist. She pointed out some of the problems with this paper and some of the dermatologists have pointed them out too. A lot of people don't realize that dermatologists, they don't just look at skin conditions, they also look at hair and nail conditions. Or at least they look at the bit that is living, which is very much the bit that's involved in hair loss. Problem one, 2% minoxidil. Minoxidil is one of the best studied treatments for hair loss, and that's why this paper sounds so impressive. But the detail here is 2%. The vast majority of dermatologists recommend at least minoxidil 5% to grow hairs because 2% is just too weak. I honestly don't even remember myself when I had asked a patient to use minoxidil 2% in the last 10 years because I think they would be quite disappointed. We know that 5% minoxidil has much better efficacy when compared to 2% minoxidil, so rosemary oil was really compared against the weaker treatment. Problem two is the duration. Six months does sound like a long time, but it's actually not a long time for hair growth. Hair grows in a cycle and the average length is years, so six months is actually considered really early. It's unreliable to assess any treatment efficacy as early as six months. So I suspect if we looked at the two-year mark, minoxidil 2% will likely be more effective than rosemary oil. But like I said, there are more general red flags in this study as well. Here's one that I think anyone can spot. Look at the sample before and after photos they're not exactly impressive. I think this really reinforces what the dermatologists were saying. You just don't really expect that much of a result after six months with 2% minoxidil. The different angle and lighting for minoxidil is pretty weird and it's kind of hard to work out what you're looking at. It looks like it might be a bit closer up. But the thing that really blew my mind and stopped me from taking this study as evidence of anything was when I saw the actual hair count numbers. Here's the baseline hair count numbers at the start of the trial, and here is what they are at three months. They are exactly the same numbers. This has to be a typo. It is basically impossible to get the exact same mean and standard deviation for two groups of 50 people three months apart. You probably couldn't even get that an hour apart. And whoever made the graph from the data didn't see an issue with these numbers. They used them in the graph as well. The baseline and month three numbers are exactly the same. And obviously you are allowed to have typos. It doesn't mean that the study is automatically bad. I mean, I have typos all the time in my posts. I can't really judge. But these are two of their key data points. There are only six numbers that really matter in this whole study. They are the whole point of the study. And two of them are wrong. Can we actually trust the other four numbers? This is the sort of thing that should be picked up immediately in peer review. But this is a paper that has four authors who all supposedly looked over it and okayed it, both in the results part and in the graph. It also supposedly has peer reviewers who looked at it and none of these people corrected it. If I was a peer reviewer for this article, I would be asking to see the raw data and checking all their calculations. And right now I've been assuming that the month three numbers are the ones that are wrong, but it could actually be the baseline numbers that are wrong. If it's the baseline numbers, those are the ones that the whole experienced a significant increase in hair count at the six month endpoint result is based on. I haven't found any corrections of this or any indications that anyone has reached out to the researchers and clarified what is going on, even though this has been cited 93 times as of February 2024. We will come back to this later. Okay, so every time I look at this paper, I just see more issues and I'm not that great at stats and I haven't gone through every single word really carefully, so I'm sure there's still tons of stuff I've missed. If you take the means of these two, you get 24.08, not 0.03. 16 plus 13 out of 100 is 29%, not 21%. Figures five and six are for greasy hair and dandruff, but they are exactly the same. Well, the formatting is like a few pixels off, but if you look at the text, dandruff should have way lower numbers. They should be close to 16%, so they've just messed up the figure. These figure references are just wrong. Figures five and six aren't about scalp itching. That is actually meant to be figure seven. 
And you don't use a rating scale for depression to measure hair loss. You just don't. Depression and hair loss are completely different medical conditions. And this all just really highlights what I was saying before. A paper with serious methodological issues tends to have a lot of other issues. And you don't need to be able to spot all of these to know that this paper isn't reliable. And again, it's not like having some typos completely invalidates the paper. There are lots of good papers out there that might have mix-ups with figures that might happen during the final formatting and then the journal will issue a correction and everything is fine. But if there's just a whole bunch of issues like there are here, that is a huge red flag that something is just not right. And some of these, especially the calculation errors, you don't have the full data set available, so you just have to kind of trust that they did the calculations correctly. And I mean, now, even if we assume that these numbers for baseline and month six are correct, it is still really not that impressive. If we look at the absolute numbers, the average difference here is either six or two hairs. This is a group where the standard deviation is about 50 hairs. That means if you take the middle two thirds of people, there is about 100 hairs difference between them. Six or two hairs is just so small. And this graph shows how small this difference is. If you just had to eyeball this graph and look at the difference between these columns, there just isn't really a big difference at all. As a percentage, the rosemary group increased by 5.5%, minoxidil increased by 1.6%. Plus, here is the thing about hair. The amount of hair that we have on our heads will naturally fluctuate. That's because there are three stages of hair growth, which are called antigen, catagen, and telogen. The hairs on our heads are distributed into these three stages, so we have more or less consistent shedding, but it isn't completely consistent. We have a bit more hair in spring, so more hairs are in the antigen stage, and we shed a bit more hair in autumn, so more hairs are in the telogen stage, which is when they can fall out. It's like a weak version of how animals will shed their winter coats all at once, but for some people, this difference can lead to noticeable shedding at different times of the year. This study took place between April 2010 and June 2011 in the Northern Hemisphere. So if you had a few more people starting their six months around June 2010 than over here or over here, then you would see an increase in the average hair count, even if the treatment wasn't having any effect. And if you look at the hair counts in other studies for the placebo treatment, which is where they have no active ingredients, you can sometimes see similar or bigger fluctuations. In this study, you can see that the placebo group goes from an average of 132 to 191 hairs, which is an increase of 45%. If we look at what happened in this study with minoxidil 2%, at six months, it actually gave an increase in terminal hair count of 123% which is a lot more impressive than 5%. And as well as seasonal variation, there are a whole bunch of other things that could be impacting hair growth. It could be the fact they're massaging their scalp twice a day. It could be something else in the lotion having an effect. The details of the lotion aren't given in the paper. And these fluctuations could also explain why so many people on social media claim that rosemary oil worked for them. One thing that we haven't talked about yet is that sudden hair loss often happens because of a specific stressful event. For example, if you've been really sick or if you've been really stressed, and honestly, that kind of covers all of us over the last few years. This sudden hair loss is called telogen effluvium, and it's common with COVID, as well as things like sudden weight loss or surgery. And after the stressful event stops, your hair will gradually grow back. But usually it's when your hair is at its worst, that is where you're going to be looking at remedies and trying out things that you see promoted on social media, like rosemary oil. And so you'll see your hair grow back right after you've tried them and you'll think it's the treatment working, even if it was going to grow back all along anyway. This effect is called regression to the mean, and I talk about this more in my video on why anecdotal evidence isn't really reliable. There's also the issue of perception. A lot of things do impact whether we think something works, and this can actually be seen in some hair loss studies. In some studies, as well as looking at hair count, they also asked the subjects whether they felt like their hair loss improved. So for example, in this study, you can see that a lot of people felt like the hair loss was worse after 16 weeks of using 5% minoxidil, even though according to the photographs, none of them were worse. And in this rosemary oil study, the self-assessments do seem maybe a bit too good to be true. At three and six months, all of the people using rosemary oil said that their hair loss had decreased. None of them said no change or that it got worse. For 2% minoxidil, all of the people said that hair loss decreased at six months and only seven people said there was no change or it got worse at three months. 
Now, if you look at other studies, even in studies that use 5% minoxidil, you'll see people saying that there was no change even with much bigger average changes in hair count. So it just seems like there's something very weird going on in this rosemary oil study. And as you'd expect for a treatment that probably doesn't have that much of an effect, as well as people on social media saying rosemary oil worked for them, there are also heaps of people saying rosemary oil actually made their hair loss worse. So what does this study actually tell us? I don't think it really tells us much at all. The most generous thing we could say, in my opinion, is that in a study that has really sus numbers where a low concentration of minoxidil, unsurprisingly, didn't do very much, rosemary oil also didn't do much. And this shows us another problem with the scientific literature. Peer-reviewed articles cite other peer-reviewed articles, and a lot of the time they don't actually look very closely at them. This rosemary oil paper has been cited 93 times, and just to give an indication of the problem and how so much crap gets through peer review, here are just the first eight articles that cited this paper I got off Google Scholar. Only one of them even indicates any sort of skepticism about this study. There are a few other studies with rosemary oil, but they mostly use mixtures where rosemary oil is just one of the components, so it doesn't really tell us much about rosemary oil specifically. But even if that wasn't an issue, the studies themselves aren't super convincing either. Okay, so if if the only clinical study showing that rosemary oil works for hair loss is pretty unconvincing, what are we left with? While the intro and the discussion do mention why they wanted to look at rosemary oil in the first place, it could potentially work in ways that are thought to improve hair loss. In other words, it has potentially beneficial mechanisms of action. It could potentially increase blood flow to hair follicles, and it's also an antioxidant which could neutralize reactive free radicals, which could be theoretically contributing to hair loss. But the problem with relying on this sort of mechanistic logic is that there are a lot of mechanisms happening inside your body, and they can have completely opposite effects. So you can usually come up with mechanistic reasons why a particular ingredient could cause both good and bad outcomes. It's a lot like trying to work out whether your friend Brian is going to be early or late to lunch today. You can come up with lots of reasons why he might be early. He doesn't live very far away, he likes to wake up early, he has a car and he's a good driver. He is usually a pretty hungry dude. You can probably also come up with lots of reasons why he might be late. He has a busy job, it's hard to get parking near the cafe, it's raining, there's a bit of traffic. And yeah, some of these reasons are more convincing than others. Sometimes these reasons could be so convincing that you pretty much know. Like if Brian posted an Instagram story two minutes ago of his flat tire. But most of the time, these reasons are nowhere near as useful as looking at past examples of the same outcome. In other words, is Brian usually early or late when you meet up? And the closer the past examples are to your current situation, the better your guess will be. Is he usually early or late when you've met up at this specific cafe for lunch before, when it's raining and there's a bit of traffic? And that's why clinical trials, which is where the treatment gets tested on actual people and the outcomes get measured, that's why they are so useful. They give us a gauge on what happens when all of these competing mechanistic reasons add up, which ones outweigh the other ones. My PhD was in medicinal chemistry, which is the start of the drug discovery pipeline. We would usually start with really promising ingredients, which are called lead compounds, with good mechanistic and in vitro evidence. Those would go through more testing and hopefully they would turn out to be useful drugs. And even with really good mechanistic evidence, one in 10,000 of these compounds that we tried would work well enough in humans to end up as a successful drug. And the main reason that different compounds would fail was usually lack of clinical efficacy. In other words, we know from experience that things with promising mechanisms don't necessarily work well in actual people. And these drug candidates we were looking at would usually have a way higher level of mechanistic evidence and convincing animal data, which rosemary oil just doesn't have. And that's why properly approved drugs like minoxidil should really be your first point of call. To get approved as a drug, it doesn't just have mechanistic evidence, it actually worked in clinical trials too. I've come across some people saying that rosemary oil can block the enzyme that converts testosterone to THT, which causes some types of hair loss. It's called 5-alpha reductase. And this is really promising because it's how the hair loss drug finasteride works. This is the only study, but there are a bunch of problems because everything about rosemary just seems to be problems. The way the researchers made this rosemary extract that they tested means that it has very different components from rosemary essential oil, which is what everyone on social media is talking about. The essential oil has mostly stuff that evaporates easily, but this procedure means that you get a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't evaporate. And the substance that they think is the active also isn't found in essential oil. 
But say you decide you want to make your own rosemary extract using their procedure, then now the problem is they needed 2,000 times more rosemary extract to get the same effect as finasteride in their enzyme test, which just has the enzyme swimming in a test tube. One mil of 0.25% finasteride is usually used as a scalp treatment per day, so if this was getting into the scalp as well as a really optimized solution of finasteride, you would need almost 5 grams on your scalp, and that's about a teaspoon. In the experiment, they dissolved 2 milligrams in 100 microliters of alcohol, which converts to about a cup of liquid. Everyone is struggling to get a quarter teaspoon of sunscreen on their face, so good luck with getting 200 times that onto your scalp. They also tested that specific compound, and you needed a lot less of that to have the effect. You only needed 230 times as much compared to finasteride to get two-thirds of the effect. But the concentration of this in rosemary is really low, so to get that two-thirds of the effect compared to finasteride, assuming it gets into the scalp as easily, you would have to use up two kilograms of rosemary leaves every day. So after all of that, is rosemary oil worth trying? In my opinion, no. For me, the lack of clinical trials besides this one puts it back at the bottom of the heap. There isn't much to support it apart from mechanistic reasons, which just don't really give it a great chance of working, and the level of this mechanistic evidence is really not that high either. There's also the fact that it's a natural product, so the levels of any potential active ingredients in rosemary oil, they're going to vary a lot depending on where it's grown, when it's grown, how it's harvested, how it's extracted, and how it's stored. There are actually three main types of rosemary oil, which are named based on what their major components are. It looks like this study used the cineol version, which they aren't really clear about, but even within cineol rosemary oils, there is a whole bunch of variation. Plus, essential oils contain allergens and irritants, and these could actually make hair loss worse, so there are competing mechanisms that could counteract the potential benefits. Rosemary oil has camphor, carnosol, and cineol, for example, which have been reported to be irritating and allergenic for some people. And we can actually see hints of this in the study. Scalp itching and dandruff actually increase for the rosemary oil group. Scalp itching also increased for minoxidil, but again, thanks to other better quality clinical trial evidence, we know that any irritation that could lead to hair loss gets outweighed by the hair growth mechanisms. We know that overall, minoxidil doesn't lead to hair loss, but we don't know this for rosemary oil. A side note, this study doesn't actually say how they collected this irritation data, which is another huge red flag, because a study really shouldn't be missing the methodology for a full page and a bit of their results. If you do end up trying rosemary oil, please make sure that it is diluted. If this study used Sydney oil rosemary oil, they diluted it by about 162 times. So that is one drop of rosemary oil per 161 drops of carrier oil, or one drop rosemary oil per 8 mils of carrier oil. It's also worth remembering that hair loss treatments generally are better at helping you keep your current hair and making it thicker. It doesn't really help you regrow dead hair. So the longer you try out less proven remedies and delay using more proven treatments, the worse your outcomes will actually be. So things you should try instead for hair loss, it is best to talk to your doctor or dermatologist. Sometimes hair loss is because of an underlying condition or deficiency or allergy, and if you go back and fix that, then the hair loss will resolve. And depending on the type of hair loss you have, there are often more proven treatments like minoxidil. If you are going to try rosemary oil, it is probably a good idea to try more proven methods at the same time. Sometimes there isn't a reliable solution, but it is still a good idea to make sure there isn't some more serious underlying condition that you're missing. If you want more videos on hair care science, you can check out this playlist. If you want a deep dive on how we sometimes know ingredients work even when the evidence isn't that great, you can check out my video on whether retinol is a scam.